Hi guys, this is Jenny Lyles. Welcome to Out of My Mind. Today, we're going to talk about how to set boundaries using scripts that go from softest to firmest in dealing with various kinds of boundary crossings. We're gonna to focus today on physical boundary crossings, and I wanna talk for a moment on what the four levels of firmness you're going to be using are and what they mean. The first of those levels, the softest level, is to avoid the confrontation. You might be nonverbal. You're often going to be too soft at this level. You're going to possibly avoid people without explaining why you're avoiding them because you don't want to hurt their feelings. It can be, however, the only safe choice um, if you feel like there may be violence coming, such as ghosting after a remarkably unpleasant first date where you don't trust the person you went on the date with. Now, the next softest of these particular boundary setting tools is to ask that your boundary be respected. So in this case, you're gonna use a conversational tone. You're going to just talk you and me, relaxed. You're going to use please. You're going to be quiet and respectful. You're going to be trying to talk like you're talking to a friend or a customer you're trying to please because in these cases, you often want to retain the relationship. And so you're hoping that this is as far as you're going to have to go, that because of the relationship, if you ask, you will get some movement on that boundary. The next level is the tell level. And a little deeper voice, a little more from the chest. I call it my dog training voice. When you're telling a dog to sit or lie down, you're not going to be playful about it. You're going to use a particular kind of voice that expects a result. You are going to be firm and clear. You are not necessarily going to be loud. The firmest form of a boundary crossing prevention is going to be when you have asked and then have told and that person has clearly heard you and clearly is ignoring you. If you feel safe to hold your boundaries in those times, it's time to demand that your boundary be honored it helps if there's witnesses who are willing to come to your defense. You can be loud, but you want to keep your voice authoritative and coming from your chest. You want to sound like you're barking like a dog, not yelping like a dog. You want to sound like you are going to follow up with any issues that you have from this person, from them refusing to honor your boundaries. This is not going to be your go-to choice. You don't want to start straight up at demanding because that is going to cost you a lot of relationships really quickly. What you're going to want to do is start at soft, occasionally softest, and work your way up. Occasionally, you can start at telling instead of asking if you need to. You're going to have to use some judgment here. I can't give you a prescription that'll work in every situation because your safety is always going to come first. The importance of the relationships you are trying to improve boundaries with is going to matter, and I don't have that information. Now, there is something that I like to call beyond firm, 
and that's when you can't handle the situation by yourself and you need to call in help. Now this help can be another bystander, it can be a family member, it can be a friend, a coworker, it can be law enforcement. Now remember law enforcement does not always make situations better, quite often they make situations worse. So use these choices judiciously because you don't want to make a situation worse when all you're trying to do is make sure that you're heard and your rights are respected. As I said, we are now going to talk about physical boundary crossings when people are moving into your physical space and how you can handle them in four different types of circumstances. The first circumstance is if your boundaries, your physical boundaries are being violated when you are in a public space. The second is going to be when your physical boundaries are being violated and you are in a work or school situation or another situation where there is an authority involved and you are expected to be doing something productive. The third situation you may need to tell somebody to get out of your personal space is with family and friends. This gets a little more complicated because with a family and friend situation, you're going to be dealing with people with whom either you want to keep a relationship with, or if you don't, other people in your circle will want to keep a relationship with. So you're going to want to navigate that tension in between having your boundaries respected and trying not to break up your friendship circle too much. Finally, we're going to talk about intimate partner situations where you are having your intimate partner, whether this is a sexual relationship or a romantic relationship, who is crossing your boundaries, whether this is a first time it has happened or a recurring event. So, in public, the person who is making the boundary crossing is likely to be a stranger. Um, as an aside, when you don't have extra space, and I'm going to do a little physical demonstration here, I want you to imagine that my pen caps are people's faces and they're standing face to face with each other, okay? So this is face to face. Now, if you are forced to be in a crowd and you are feeling uncomfortable because your nose and their nose are right next to each other, you're gonna wanna turn sideways. You're not gonna wanna turn so your back's at that person, but if you turn sideways, your tension goes down, their tension goes down, you start feeling calmer in that situation. It feels like they're further away. So that's something you can do when nobody's actually crossing your boundary, but you're feeling unsafe in a physical space because it's too crowded. It can also work, by the way, as one of your nonverbals in that softest section of simply avoiding the situation, like moving out of the way, moving your, your, your body perpendicular like we just talked about, changing seats, move to the other side of el the elevator, things like that. These are all easier to do in public situations than some of the others because you're not likely to have a recurrent problem with this person. So you're not going to have to have that conversation eventually that this person needs to really respect your boundaries. So when you have public people doing that, your next step is going to be to ask them to move or to ask them to allow you to have room. So you might say something like, could you please move over a little bit? I'm feeling a bit crowded. And you noticed how I had a softness to my voice and this goes for men and women. When you are dealing in these situations and you don't want the confrontation to get ugly, sometimes you wanna start with a soft, kind voice like you are not a threat, you're just asking politely for an accommodation that's a reasonable accommodation in a public place. 
Now, let's suppose that person is kind of giving you the look like I can take as much space as I want because I'm a rude person and I don't value your time, your attention, or anything about you, and I just want to be a nasty person. Well, if that person does that, then the next step is going to be to tell them that you want your space. So you might say something like, you're in my space, please back off. Or, can I sit here now, please? There is not enough room for you to have your bag on the chair next to you. And you notice that I didn't have a soft voice at that point. I very consciously worked from my diaphragm, which is way down in my belly, to get lots of air into what I was saying so that it sounded more authoritative. Remember, I want to, at this point, when we are at firm and I'm telling somebody to kind of sound like I'm telling a dog to sit or to stay or lie down or in lady's case no lick lady because she thinks licking is medicine and we can't convince her otherwise no much no matter how much training we give her the firmest version is going to be even more loud and a little bit scary maybe for the person, which is why you save it for later. Always use your judgment. Make sure you're safe before you do this. Um, this person is really beginning to feel a little bit scary. Um, make sure you try to look around, catch the eye of a sympathetic on onlooker if you can, and then say something like, back off or back up. Try to get somebody to notice that you are needing help. If the person is threatening assault, if you believe they are likely to assault you by based on their body movements, based on the words they're using, based on their tone of voice, um, engage those bystanders to help you. If absolutely necessary, contact law, law enforcement and do what you need to do to be safe. But if you are feeling like maybe this person is going to have that kind of confrontation with you, this might be a good time to go all the way back to that softest of soft boundary crossing solutions of just getting out of the way and avoiding the problem because this is not going to be a recurring problem with this person and it may not be worth the energy to do all that just to be able to sit down on the subway today. The next situation I want to talk about is if you are at work or at school or some other situation where you are expected to follow a group of rules and there is an authority above you and you have a role to play that is important to the overall place where this is happening. So the person who is causing the boundary conflict where they're moving into your personal space is likely to be a peer or an authority or occasionally a customer or a client. And I'm going to ask you to treat customers kind of the same way you would treat a peer because as corporations will tell us ad nauseum, customers are internal and external and our coworkers are our customers and we should be treating them with politeness all the time. The person causing the problem is going to cause significant problems for you if you don't respect your corporate rules, your school rules, whatever they are, in the process of getting this person out of your space. So you need to know what the rules are, and those rules can be written or unwritten, and you need to follow them. So keeping that in mind, because I don't know the rules of your space, that's your job. Let's talk about the softest way to deal with a peer or a customer. You might move out of the way. You might use some signal to show that you are not available, such as putting on headphones or sitting at a break table. Uh, you might stand up and, and do the, the classic cubicle 
I need you to leave my cubicle movement that people make or a desk very similar where you just kind of step up enough to kind of block their entrance into your space and kind of herd them out of it. And all of these are things you can do without saying a word and they're soft and they tend to avoid conflict because you're not doing anything that in any way threatens an authority or threatens somebody by believing that you can't, you know, that you aren't meeting their needs. Again, you have to follow your rules and let's move on to what you do with an authority when they are getting inside your physical space. We'll go back to that perpendicular move because authorities are often telling you something that they feel is vitally important for you to know and they are likely to get offended if you don't stay in your seat but you can calm yourself and ease the situation greatly by doing that little perpendicular mood where you move sideways to the person confronting you in such a way that your tension goes down and hopefully their tension goes down as well and you can start from there. Another way is putting a desk between you or a counter in such a way that it looks like, you know, you're, you're trying to do what they want you to do. You are following their instructions and it just so happens that in following their instructions, you are putting things between you that make it harder for them to touch you or to loom over you. A soft and ask thing you would do with a peer or an authority or a customer would be to say something like, do you mind if I change seats? I feel a bit crowded. Or you might say, excuse me, I need to step back here for a moment or something like that. You just want to use a please and an excuse me and words to that effect and also kind of go back and do the movement that you're talking about doing as you're talking about doing it so that this person is aware that you're following through and that this isn't just kind of a conversation you're having. When you get to the firm tell place, when you're dealing with a peer or a customer who has gotten to the point where uh, other coworkers or customers have noticed that this person is being inappropriate and you need to take action, you might say something like, let's say the coworker is named Bob. Hey, Bob, step out of my cubicle. I'm uncomfortable with you standing up close. Or if you've got a regular client or a customer, uh, hey, June, I, I know I've talked with you about this before. Please take a couple steps back. Or, sir, you cannot be in that area of the store. We don't allow that here. These are all reasonable requests and they are told as that dog training voice in, in a business or school environment. You aren't necessarily going to be quite as firm in that voice because you have to also put in that customer service voice, which is a little softer, but you're going to want to work in that range of things. Now, when you're dealing with an authority over you, a teacher or a boss, you're going to again use the sir or ma'am piece and you're going to say, ma'am, I need to get to work on this now. I need space to work. Or you might say something like, Mrs. Baker, I can't work on my English assignment with you standing over my head. It's making me nervous. Back off, please and you just kind of use a little less ask and a little more tell in these situations. Now, if it goes beyond this point and you're in a public place where everybody has roles, one of two things has happened. Either we have a customer out of control, an employer out of control, or an employee out of control, or possibly like a teacher, an administrator, a student out of control, or we have a broken system that is failing to protect you from people pr 
praying into your physical space. So you're going to have to get very real at this point. So you might say to a peer, stop talking or I'm going to the boss and name the boss or hey, stop it or I'm going to HR. This is unacceptable. You know, that kind of thing. If you're talking to a peer, if you're talking to somebody um, who's a customer and you know that your, custo your company has your back, that might be how you deal with that. If you're dealing with an authority who is way out of control and you know that the corporation will have your back, and this is important, then you're going to say, ma'am, I need you to get out of my space. If you don't give me my space, I'm going to HR then go to HR or go to corporate or go to the higher authority, which would be the principal at a school or possibly another admin. If that authority is not helping you, it's time to start looking for another job. And again, like we talked in the first time, if you are in a situation where the authorities who are supposed to protect you won't, Sometimes it's your safe move to go all the way back to softest where you're avoiding things. You don't want to do this as a permanent solution, but you may need to go back to it every now and then for safety's sake. In a social or family situation, it gets a lot more complicated. Like I said before, when you're in a social or family situation, not only are you trying to preserve the relationship with the person you're trying to set boundaries with, because they may be important to you or they may be important to other people that you care about, but you're also trying to not undo the network of friends and family that is a major part of the social network of your life. So you don't want to break that apart. And there's a lot of complicating factors here, guys, and we don't have the space to go through that today. But let's just say that it's always going to be your choice to go from avoid to ask to tell to demand. And you're going to have to weigh the advantages of doing each of those against the disadvantages of choosing to set that boundary at that time. Sometimes gathering allies helps which we can talk about at another date. But for right now, let's talk a little bit about how you can deal with the person in your family or friendship group that is causing problems. Now, that person is either going to be somebody who is a respected elder in that group. They're going to be a peer to you in that group. That would be a sibling or a cousin or a friend. Um, or they're going to be a youngster in the group, somebody new to the group, or a child, or somebody that you are kind of in a training role over. And by the way, this training role can also be used in school settings if you have a training role in those or in work settings. So let's start with the softest way you can deal with an elder or a peer. So you're talking about avoiding you're going to want to move to put a little more space between you and Uncle Joe or Cousin Joan who always gets in your space and wants to tickle or touch or pinch cheeks or whatever it is that's truly annoying that you don't want them to do. And you can excuse yourself to the restroom. That is always a perfectly acceptable thing. You can go to your bedroom or another private space wherever you guys are meeting. Um, if you're in a friendship group, you can excuse yourself for a moment and go outside for some air, things like that, right? Now, the softest thing you can do with a youngster, if a youngster is invading your space, chances are they're crawling all over you because that's what youngsters do. And occasionally, you know, in a friendship group, that youngster isn't exactly crawling all over you, but it's you know, because they're not literally a youngster, they're just not new to the rules of your group. But if it's a physical youngster, you're going to want to physically move that child out of your space. You are going to say, you, you actually, you're not going to say anything. You're just going to pick them up and move them out of their, your, your space and put them back down. And you're going to do this gently and it's not going to be a big deal. You're just going to reinforce that your space is your space without saying much of anything and without drawing a lot of attention to it or making a big deal about it. 
the next step is that ask place. And when you're dealing with an elder or a peer, you are dealing with somebody who you're going to ask, again in that soft voice, let's say the problem is tickling and you hate being tickled, and you're going to say, please, Uncle Joe, don't tickle me. I hate being tickled. Or, uh, please, buddy, you know, my best friend here, you know how much I hate being tickled. Please stop, right? Now, when you're dealing with a youngster, you're going to add a little bit of education here. You're going to not only going to say, please don't tickle me, you might also add, please only tickle people who have told you it's okay. Because like we've talked about before, all forms of touch are consent only. So please don't hug me, please don't tickle me, please don't kiss me. All of those are the same. And you're going to teach a child to always ask before they do these things. Now, this is where it gets complicated when we're dealing with friends and family, because at the point where we get to firm and we get to telling people what we want, we start getting accused of not playing by the family rules. And this is often because somebody's bad behavior has been accepted in the family for a very, very long time, and it is more trouble to the family to stop that person's behavior than it is to stop you from trying to stop them. So they are instead going to turn to you and try to get you to stop it, rather than to turn to Uncle Joe, who really needs to stop touching people without permission and probably needs to be investigated at some point and tell him to knock off his behavior. So you are likely to get pushback at the firm level and above whenever you're dealing with a friendship group or a family. And keep that in mind and keep your safety in mind. So for a firm elder, you might say, hey, Uncle Joe, I mean it. Please stop tickling me. This works best if you've got somebody else in the room who's already got a problem with Uncle Joe's problem with touching people and is going to back you up and say, hey, he said leave it alone or she said leave it alone. Knock it off, right? If you don't have that person, you might have a bit of a problem, but it's probably not going to be a huge problem. If it's a child that's doing that behavior, you can step in and say, it's not funny to keep doing things after people have asked you to stop. I asked you to stop. Please stop. All right. So you're, again, using a bit of a dog trainer voice. You're trying to let that child know that you are serious. You are not a threat, but you are somebody they need to pay attention to. Okay. Now, finally, when you get to firmest, like I said, you have some significant risk at this point of breaking relationships within your family or friendship group, and you need to go cautiously and decide whether it's worth it to you to break this relationship and any relationships that may also break as a result. And when you've made that decision, go ahead. So you might grab Uncle Joe's hands. You might move them off of them. You might just turn around and stare at them hard while holding on to those hands that were touching you and say quietly, I respect you. I'm asking you respectfully to not do that again. And you hear how I'm doing this. And unlike in a public place, you are going to want to have this conversation a little more privately because you don't want to embarrass Uncle Joe because the point is trying to save the other relationships in the room while at the same time dealing with Uncle Joe's behavior. So you want him to be in a position where he's a little bit embarrassed and he just got told, but that he doesn't have to save face because you didn't do it in front of everybody. Now, if it's a peer, if it's, aunt, uh, I'm sorry, cousin Joan, you might say, I'm done, get out of my space. And again, most of the time, friendship groups are gonna honor that but if this is somebody whose behavior has been like this for years and years and years, you might be seen as the problem, and that is a consequence of setting boundaries 
and that's okay and you just need to make the decision how much boundary setting do you want to do and how much accommodating of your friendship group do you want to do. Intimate partners are inherently dangerous at times. So keep this in mind all the way through this conversation. Again, don't do anything that doesn't make you feel safe and make sure that you have an exit if at all possible. Your softest move when somebody is, let's say, making the moves on you and you thought you were there to Netflix, not chill, right? So you're going to move away. You're going to use your body language by closing off your body and moving your shoulders away. You're going to face away from them. You're going to look down and not look them in the eye. You're going to do things like this. This is going to be your avoidant tactic. You're going to excuse yourself and going to the restroom just to collect yourself for a little bit. Those types of things. This is often not enough because uh, one of the way that people who cross boundaries and think physical ways justify it to themselves is that they pretend that they cannot read body language. It is true that some people cannot read body language. Those people exist. Many people who um, are autists, people with autism, are people who struggle with body language and that is real for them and they will often be very good at consent because they are aware of this and they will ask directly at every stage of a relationship to ensure that they are getting full consent. This is often not true among some people whose real goal is to get you to do what they want and they don't really care much about consent. So the next thing you do after avoiding is that soft please. Please don't touch me like that. Or, hey honey, I need to do some stuff. Can you please give me a little room? You know, let's say you're in a long-term relationship and honey is horny and you are in the middle of trying to do something for a project you need done at school or work tomorrow, okay? Next, you get to firm. And firm is not right now or no or knock it off or something like that. At this point, if this person is not knocking it off, you are in the danger zone. Get out if you can if you don't feel safe. If you can't, it's important to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I will have a link to that in the article to this video so that you can go back to oomm.live and look up that article and that can help you with this. But you're going to want to get attention drawn to you. Screaming is okay, but unfortunately in our world, Screaming often doesn't bring anybody to help. A lot of women are told to yell fire rather than help because in our society, quite often women who are crying for help are ignored where fire is paid attention to. So make sure that you're in a safe situation whenever you can. Set your boundaries whenever you can. Think about how you're going to set them. What style works best for you? What style works best for the situation? What style works best for the relationship you're trying to maintain? Or if there's no relationship to maintain? And remember that I post these videos approximately twice a week, normally on Tuesdays and Fridays. And they are available at patreon.com backslash j-l-i-l-e-s and at my website at www.oomm.live. I strongly encourage you to subscribe, like, share, and comment on my videos because the more people who learn about these things, the more peaceful world we're going to have the less trauma we are going to have. I am trying to work myself out of a job treating trauma by treating trauma in as many people as I can, and I need your help. So please subscribe, like, comment, and share on all of my videos and articles and audio files that you read and enjoy. Thank you, and I will see you again soon. I certainly hope that your week is wonderful and I hope that you get a couple of opportunities to practice setting boundaries in non-threatening ways 
that feel like you have a success ahead of you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.